Yeah, now very officially welcome to the session entitled Dynamic International Relations on the Korean Peninsula. My name is Hannes Mosel and I'll be chairing this panel. As you know, <clears throat> sorry, as you know from the program, we have two hours in total for the presentations, for the designated discussions and the ensuing Q&A session. And uh, this is how we will proceed first. We will listen to the two presentations. Our first presenter is Virginia Jeslek from Aston University in the UK. Virginia will speak on the topic changing dynamics of North Korea applications for security. And our second presenter is Eric Balbach from, from Freie Universität Berlin in Germany. And his topic is North Korea's emerging nuclear state identity. And each presentation will take about 15 minutes. So after this first 30 minutes, we will then turn to the designated discussants. These are Ad Griffith from the University of Central Lancashire, Ki Gyeong Chang from University of Duisburg Essen, Lonnie Edge from Hanguk University of Foreign Studies, and later on Sarah Sun from the University of Sheffield will join. And then we have Marco Milani from the University of Bologna, as well as Nicholas Levy from the Institute of Mediterranean and Oriental cultures. Wow, uh, what a lineup. Um, this um, then will make not less than six discussions who have prepared uh, to briefly talk about both of the presentations for a maximum of five minutes in total. In other words, this will take another 30 minutes. And after this first hour, I will then give the two presenters, of course, the opportunity to react to the comments uh, and to answer questions that came up during the discussions. And then we will either have another round of questions from the designated discussions and replies, or we will open the virtual floor to the audience to raise questions or to contribute otherwise to our exchange here in this session, this uh, European morning. And at that point, I probably will collect questions from the floor through the QR code function. So the audience, other than uh, the panel, can pose questions by scanning the QR code and then follow the link. And those questions that you pose will be collected and sent to me. And I will then forward those questions to the panelists. Um, so the basic plan is, again, we listen to the two presentations, hear the comments and questions, have the two presenters react, and then in the end, open the discussion to the floor. So that's the plan. Are there any questions from the panelists, from the discussants regarding uh, this procedure? Uh, uh, I can't hear the floor, so <laughs> there can't be any comments now from the floor. But if everyone of you is OK with this procedure, then I would like to ask Virginie to enlighten us with her presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that. So I'll share my screen um, to launch uh, this. Hopefully everything's working well. All right. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, for having me this morning. It's, it's morning here in the in the UK, just just eight o'clock. So it's a it's a good way to start the day. Uh, talking uh, talking about security dynamics over the Korean Peninsula. Um, so what I wanted to do with this presentation is to take a little bit of a broader view. I think it's going to fit well uh, with the second presentation as well. Hopefully we'll have some, some good discussion later on. But I wanted to start by uh, actually going back to uh, uh, something that um, uh, former Secre US Secretary of State um, William Perry said in 2003, uh, at a time when the DPRK uh, decided to withdraw from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so what um, uh, Perry noted then is that um, there was some, some clear disagreement both in the policy world and also uh, in the literature um, around uh, a concept of, um, of conflict over the Korean Peninsula. Um, but what what um, he was suggesting was that regardless of how you, you looked at it, you just could not avoid talking about the notion of crisis uh, when, you are, when you are considering the, the, uh, 
uh, the situation. If we are taking a step back and thinking, okay, well, this was 2003, it's not, not that surprising. Uh, but that was also a time when the DPRK uh, was yet to test a nuclear weapon, uh, let it be several. Um, it was also a time uh, when um, the DPRK and the ROK had connected via the family reunion uh, in, in, um, in 2000, via um, some um, avenues uh, led by, uh, by Kim Jae-jung, for example, to, uh, to try to have a more positive future over the Korean Peninsula. Um, so that was also uh, at a time when perhaps we were still expecting the DPRK not to really make it uh, from, from, from an economic uh, perspective, or at least needed some serious help and having a system that would be completely transformed if there were to be reunification. Um, but this is now, and this is you know, seven decades after uh, the, uh, the, the, the development, the, the creation of both Koreas, um, and we're also three decades after uh, the end of the Cold War, and we're also you know, more, than, you know, more than a decade after North Korea's first nuclear, nuclear test. So how we understand the Korean Peninsula, um, along quite a, lot of, um, quite a lot of lines, I've listed a few things here, a few themes uh, that often come about uh, in, in the scholarship discussion and that are of, obviously inferred uh, from um, uh, policy and what ha is happening in terms of, of, of actual, uh, um, actual events. So we have things still pertaining to the legacy of the Korean War. We have a lot of work being done still on comparing and trying to see where we can have uh, some, uh, some interaction point between um, the two Korean system, the question of Korean national identity and its future is, uh, is, is, is encompassing um, um, for, uh, for, for, for this generation, but also for, for the future generation. Obviously, we're still looking at patterns of interaction and negotiation. Security is very important. The change of balance of power when we have questions uh, regarding commitment of allies, for example, uh, especially when it comes to the United States. Foreign relations between um, Koreas and, and the great powers, and actually both Koreas here, plural. I mean, we used to only maybe consider a specific set of relationship when it came to DPRK and other uh, parts of the world. And this, this has actually expanded. Um, the, the, the question of foreign policy has, has expanded. Scenarios for the future, obviously, and the the the, the important question: How do we avoid uh, a, a nuclear war? Though, though these days it seems that you know nuclear weapons uh, uh, have uh, have taken the back backseat to to COVID, uh, really in, in in that sense affecting a, a, a soul. Um, so. Um, what is very interesting, I think, is that uh, this, this North Korean endurance uh, and survival has actually prompted a change uh, in scholarship as well. So it's really no longer um, appropriate to some extent to speak of an imminent North Korean collapse, as it was the case after just after the Cold War, for example. And it's also no longer enough to attribute the Korean crisis to one isolated factor, for example, such as the North Korean leadership or such as the U.S. influence over the region, or such as, for example, China's quest to, to rebalance power um, over the region. So instead, um, I think theoretical creativity has been favored, uh, and well, this is in theory, but also in, in, in practice, we are trying to find what different ways um, actually to, to go beyond and to achieve uh, what I think is the common goal, which is essentially uh, a peaceful Korean peninsula and, and um, a sustainable future for, um, for generations. So what I decided to bring uh, to the table here um, is, is the, the concept of, of frozen conflict, uh, which uh, you know, starts to be accurate as we're going into September and it starts to be cold and some of us had to put you know, heating on in Britain because it was very cold over the past few days. So you know, we are setting up for the winter. Um, and this concept of, um, I think, frozen conflict is particularly interesting uh, when applying to um, the Korean situation. So, um, I've listed a, a, a definition here that's coming from, from Ludwig and, and Smetana. Uh, a frozen conflict is a protracted and post-war conflict process that has essentially failed to reach uh, a peaceful and stable stage between contending actors. Um, what is quite interesting with this concept of uh, um, uh, a frozen conflict is that um, it usually starts in a war and it's under, it ends up in a situation that is neither peer nor war. Um, those conflicts have usually been understood under uh, a post within a post-Soviet context, and they have really centered on Eurasian countries. They often have also involved um, great powers. 
So when we are trying to to, to translate this to the Korean uh, to the Korean Peninsula question, um, it's actually uh, a very good fit, and it helps us perhaps understand some of the dynamics. Um, the very important element here is essentially you've got you know something that freezes in time, and you've got you know uh, at some point a, a change. It's going to be a thawing uh, of 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 the ice, but what remains under is what's very important. At some point, we might have also uh, some further icing, uh, but the situation or the, the, uh, the, the way that this ice is going to, to form again is going to be different. And so we have to kind of uh, think about uh, some of the changes that might have occurred while we were in this suspended uh, period of time. What this means is that there's also uh, a strong potential for violence, uh, violence resurgence. And you know, Valerie Perry, for example, has done quite a lot of work uh, um, on this. Um, so violence might have indeed been stopped, uh, but the underlying interest uh, of those warring parties uh, might actually have not been addressed. Um, so um, Korean Peninsula is, is quite salient to this um, because we have uh, obviously a very strong influence uh, um, uh, of the post-Soviet paradigm as well. We have engagements of um, large powers uh, and we have uh, via the armistice in a way a suspension um, of some parts, some aspects of the conflict. So that's all fine and good, but how is it uh, useful for us uh, to, to, to go beyond actually what we have in the Korean Peninsula? So what's very interesting is how a frozen conflict can evolve. Um, so there are three ways uh, a, a frozen conflict can, can evolve. The first one is, is through what's called peaceful thawing. So essentially, we are going to get to a point where this ice is going to be uh, to, to, to go away. Uh, and that is usually going to be because of, of principles such as you know, diplomacy and negotiation. So you're going to have you know, a, a host of, uh, of, of actions that are going to lead uh, to that. The second uh, option is, is violence sowing. So it's um, a return actually to a, a state of violent and, and major warfare. So instead of having you know, the, the sowing uh, going little by little and this transformation happening little by little, being scaffolded by other actors, uh, it's very violent. There's a crack and then we return to, to some sort of war. The third option is, is conflict withering. So uh, it's going to bring us to this, this, this state where this ice is going to be gone, but not because of diplomacy and negotiation, actually because of changing circumstances, because of what is in the ice actually really changing and making the conflict disappear. So there's a question of a, of a variable here, uh, which I think is, is quite interesting. So if we're trying to apply this uh, to the Korean Peninsula, uh, to give you just a very snapshot example before we go into, into more detail about, uh, about some, some of the data, um, we could uh, you know, look at what happened, for example, to make a little bit of a corny joke at, at the uh, you know the 2018 Winter Olympics uh, uh, in, in, um, in, in South Korea, where quite a lot of engagement with um, those Korean delegation coming to South Korea. And then this obviously started uh, a, a dialogue. We had you know, a number of summits also involving the United States. So that was a throwing. Um, but uh, what we see, you know, two years after this is that th this, ice, this ice is, is still here and has actually re, uh, reshaped uh, and, 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 and returned uh, and created different landscapes. So we have not managed to really change particularly uh, the underlying circumstances. So when we have a look at uh, uh, major events uh, over the Korean Peninsula, and I had circulated uh, in uh, the, past, the past week um, uh, an outline that had uh, a, quite a long table with a lot of events. So hopefully, if this is you know, including the proceeding of the conference, you, you can have a look at this, uh, uh, this data. We can have a look at major events over the Korean Peninsula over the past you know, 70 years, for example. Um, and what we see is this tangled web of events that operate uh, um, as nested relationships relationship and to kind of help us uh, uh, pause this, I think it's useful to use, for example, one of the categories that Michael um, Harlett put together, uh, which essentially looking at micro uh, event, looking at mesos, that's going to be more, you know, within the bilateral capability or sectorial policy regime, and then macro global security, governance, non-proliferation, UN sanction, and all of that. And so when we have a look at, um, at all those events, um, we end up seeing a, a, a number of, uh, of clusters uh, and a change, really, from, you know, things that happened really 
between the two Koreas to little by little moving to you know the region and to broader processes uh, that ended up with processes that we all know about you know the six party talk the 1994 you know agreed framework um, the four party talks as well and some some more uh, um, engagement for example with the Red Cross uh, um, around uh, uh, issues of, of Japanese abductees and all of that um, so this is actually quite quite a bit uh, that, that that we've seen. What does it mean for the two Korea when we have a look at this question of uh, um, of, of you know looking at at, at events and and reconciling this with this question of uh, um, of um, uh, conflict uh, frozen conflict? Um, when we have a look at at peaceful thawing, um, the armistice is going to be a, um, a root cause. Um, of 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 the instability, uh, and this is something that obviously has not has not been addressed. So in order to well has not been addressed has not been um, completely uh, completely dealt with. Um, so um, there's a need for security governance, but at the same time we have seen uh, quite a lot of security governance uh, efforts, uh, especially over the past 15 years. Uh, so that is uh, quite uh, quite problematic uh, because we, we we have tried a number of things. What has been uh, the deciding factor in looking at how we, we, we go to the, the sewing um, is um, the role of nuclear weapons, the role of, of North Korean nuclear weapons. Uh, because those weapons are, are both a, a catalyst um, and at the same time um, um, uh, a safeguard um, in, in the relationship. So um, nuclear weapons could very well trigger uh, violent thawing uh, because of you know, instability, because of perception, uh, because of shifting alliance and, and defense commitments as well, especially when it comes to, for example, uh, how the United States might be uh, engaged over the region. Um, at the same time, um, those nuclear weapons could provide uh, conflict withering um, because um, they uh, they prevent uh, any large scale conflict from happening. So that is this this kind of catch twenty two uh, in a way. Uh, in order to have conflict withering, we need to have also uh, an acceptance to, uh, to some extent of of a level of change uh, within the the North Korean um, society. So if we have a look at at, at more uh, uh, focused uh, focused outcomes, and I'm going you know quite quickly because I'm I'm arriving at the end of the time. There's more more information, I think, uh, and more discussion we can have uh, later on. So um, we have you know when it comes to this peaceful sowing. The expectation is that you know what this probably could have should have happened by now, given the previous vehicles um, that we've seen, given you know the the, the change in the shift, the involvement of the actor, uh, the focus that we've seen, um, uh, and especially uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, the way that so many um, uh, avenues have also been considered. Um, we, as I've mentioned, also uh, there's a question around and the DPRK capabilities for for opportunities that that maybe shift the discussion more um, to violent throwing. Um, um, violent sowing, as threatening as it is, is, is quite unlikely uh, because of the economic independence that we have seen uh, between developed between the ROK, the PRC, the USA. Uh, you know, we are all aware of, of this interdependence and how you know, we are trying to, uh, to, to, to achieve, you know, to some extent, uh, uh, prosperity. But uh, the first catch-22 is, is the possibility, obviously, of, of, of accidental violent sowing in case of weapons mishandling, for example. Um, in terms of conflict withering, um, we have um, the second catch-22, which is the idea that this violent sowing really uh, might actually, this threat of a violent sowing might be preventing us from considering conflict withering. Um, the sanctions, for example, the need for sanctions that are uh, uh, coming out of uh, the DPRK developing nuclear weapons, uh, can curtail some opportunities uh, for um, for in-depth change, uh, and um, there is little hope for change uh, if if it withering uh, is not uh, is not possible. I think one of the uh, interesting uh, and important line, perhaps, um, is that um, we have to, to some extent be willing to accept uh, that what is under the eyes has might have changed radically. Um, and what I mean by this, and I'll stop on a, on a contentious point to some extent, uh, if we're talking about peace on the Korean Peninsula, those Koreas are not the Koreas of 70 years ago. If we are going to a peaceful, uh, a peaceful situation with two Koreas uh, uh, living together next to, to one another, uh, it probably would mean that uh, the DPRK would have um, 
nuclear weapons, whereas um, the ROK would not. So there would be a, a differential uh, when it comes to uh, to the military. And so, you know, what can ex can we expect uh, when it comes to the fact that, you know, the, the future that was perhaps envisioned uh, with, you know, the ROK being uh, uh, the, 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 the leading example uh, on the current peninsula might not be that one. Uh, so uh, that's uh, where I stop for the moment. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Perfectly timed. Thank you very much for this very insightful input presentation on the frozen conflict. This is the, the concept, the notion that Virginia used in her talk on uh, Enlighten Us about what has been going on and what might be going on, um, uh, referring to, to three different ways. And I'm sure the discussants will then later come back um, to what we've heard here. And I have one or the other questions to if I later have the chance. So we um, go, move over now to the next presentation by Eric Beibach. I hope you are, oh yeah, you don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so you can start right away, right? So yes. the floor is all yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers uh, of this timely and as always very impressive event. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Imsochin for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, today's presentation builds upon earlier research I have done into what I perceive uh, is an extremely important yet often overlooked link between identity and North Korean foreign policy. In specific, I want to talk about North Korea's emerging nuclear state identity and I want to address the question if we can observe any changes in the discursive construction or the performative enactment of North Korea's nuclear state identity in the context of what John Deluri has described as the diplomatic revolution of 2018-2019 on the Korean Peninsula. The main objective of this endeavor basically is to broaden our perception of North Korea's nuclear weapons program beyond military, economic, and politic, diplom political diplomatic aspects as important as those are, of course, and to propose a view on the uh, nuclear program as a dynamic identity project of and for the North Korean state. To be sure, doing so is not merely an endeavor of uh, academic uh, relevance. <clears throat> Rather, <clears throat> as anyone sitting in on negotiations with North Korean officials can attest to, identity factors are regularly invoked both in formal and informal dialogues with DPRK officials, indicating an immediate relevance for diplomacy with the country. As its central argument, basically, I hold that to Pyongyang, uh, the nuclear weapons program has significance well beyond its military, economic and political diplomatic aspects. It has in fact become one of the most crucial identity projects of the North Korean state in the post-Cold War era, ultimately resulting in the emergence of an authoritative nuclear state identity that is still in the process of being explored. Uh, as we only have 10 minutes for my presentation, uh, I don't want to go into theoretical details, uh, but start right away by tracing the emergence and development of North Korea's nuclear state identity. While the history of North Korea's nuclear endeavors, as you all know, reached back to the 1950s, the emergence of what can be described uh, of a nuclear state identity is inherently linked to the challenges of the post-Cold War era, a time in which the very self-conception of the DPRK as a strong and autonomous state had to be reassured. I argue that the construction of a nuclear state identity is a vital element uh, of this reassurance project. In this context, the self-proclaimed status as a nuclear power has, in a relatively short period of time, become a vital, if not the most important element of North Korea's post-Cold War state identity. And it has, as we shall see later on, significant political consequences. However, uh, if we think back, this particular identity trade was all but fixed following the emergence of a first international crisis over North Korea's nuclear weapons program in the early 90s. Rather, it gradually evolved ever since 
and it is, as I argue, it's still in the process of being explored. As you all remember, all throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, North Korea continuously asserted not to possess and, in fact, not striving to possess nuclear weapons, linking its nuclear program directly to the country's pressing energy needs. The Iraq war in 2003 not only constituted a turning point in the DPRK's overall foreign policy and security strategy, but also had a profound influence on the construction of its post-Cold War state identity. It was in this context that North Korean texts uh, first claimed that Pyongyang has the natural right, quote, to produce nuclear weapons in order to protect the state and nation against what it described as the hostile US policy aimed at stifling uh, the country and the nation. A statement by the foreign ministry held uh, that the key lesson drawn by the DPRK from the Iraq war was that only, quote, tremendous military deterrent force powerful enough to decisively beat back an attack supported by ultra-modern weapons can avert a war and protect the security of the country and the nation. At the same time, it seems that the official policy line during that time has been to neither confirm nor deny any accusations about the status and ultimate objectives of its nuclear weapons program. And this resulted in quite a few conflicting statements regarding the status of its nuclear weapons program between 2003 and 2005. The first nuclear test in October 2006 was a significant turning point in the DPRK's construction of a nuclear state identity and the subsequent modes of representations used to reframe itself in terms of a nuclear weapons state. North Korean sources particularly emphasized the intimate link between the vulnerability of the DPRK as a victim and target of uh, so-called US threats and an understanding of its nuclear weapons program as an indispensable protection record for North Korea's sovereignty and security. In other words, North Korea's nuclear state identity presupposes that its sovereignty is inherently threatened and that the nuclear weapons program constitutes a legitimate defensive measure to protect not only the security of the DPRK, but uh, as uh, North Korean sources put it, peace and stability of the whole region. The resulting narratives of victimhood and threat and the narrative of defense are paralleled by an attempt to project an image of the DPRK as a responsible nuclear weapon state, a state that possesses this weapon legitimately and abides by international non-proliferation obligations. For example, during that time, North Korean sources repeatedly stated uh, that its nuclear tests are conducted, quote, under the condition where safety is firmly guaranteed and that the DPRK will never use nuclear weapons first and strictly prohibits any threat of nuclear weapons and nuclear transfer. So while the possession of nuclear weapons was designated as a unique moment in national history, however, at this particular stage of development, the text also repeatedly emphasized that the ultimate goal of the DPRK would remain the denuclearization of the Korean peninsula, thereby leaving considerable room for political and diplomatic maneuvering. So we can say that while the scripting of the nuclear discourse before 2006 and maybe even until 2008 suggests that it was still possible to reverse the DPRK's full nuclear breakout, it was in the critical years since 2008 that the identity of the top leadership in North Korea was basically fused with the image of a strong nuclear state, to quote Hayes and Bruce. During that particular period, North Korea significantly altered the rendering of its nuclear status, which now at least officially was decoupled from its relations to the US. Uh, accentuating this reversal of strategy, a DPRK spokesman uh, explained that it is, quote, the reality on the Korean peninsula that we can live without normalizing the relations with the US, but we can't live without a nuclear deterrent. So while Pyongyang was still attempted to project an image of the DPRK 
kind of a, as a responsible nuclear weapon state, it now also increasingly emphasized the DPRK's role as an exceptional one among existing nuclear weapon states worldwide. And this dual representation is basically the essence uh, of North Korea's nuclear posture statement, which was issued in April uh, 2010. While reaffirming its promise to be a responsible nuclear power, the memorandum explicitly states that the DPRK is not bound anymore by the Non-Proliferation Treaty or other international laws governing nuclear weapons. North Korea did no longer seek to obtain international rec recognition, at least officially, and legitimacy by stressing to use this capacity only for deterrence and by reassuring its neighbors and the nuclear weapon states in the region. Rather, a close reading of the North Korea's nuclear discourse at that time suggests that it became a source of pride to those in power to stress that North Korea basically stands outside all legal framework and frameworks governing nuclear weapons, simultaneously emphasizing its autonomy and attributing a self-declared nuclear outlaw status to itself. A DPRK foreign ministry spokesperson stated that North Korea, quote, does not want anybody to recognize it as a nuclear weapon state, nor feels any need to be done so. It is just satisfied with a bright and self-esteem that it is capable of reliably defending the sovereignty of the country and the security of the nation with its own nuclear weapons. A similar statement issued by the powerful National De Defense Commission at that time claims that uh, the DPRK status as a nuclear power does not depend on whether others uh, recognize it or not. Particularly important was the time just after the death of uh, Kim Jong-il, uh, in which the Nodong Shinmun issued the essay on the revolutionary legacy of Kim Jong-il, which basically holds that North Korea had been dignified as a nuclear power thanks only to the deceased supreme leader. Uh, this equation has important political ramifications as it suggests, suggests that the road to denuclearize North Korea will be a long, slow and potentially costly one. This is because a complete rejection of the nuclear weapons state status bears the risk of being interpreted as questioning the very legacy of Kim Jong-il. Against this background, it seems increasingly unlikely that the nuclear weapons status is up for negotiations anymore, or at least that the price would be very high. So at this point, the question arises as to what changes in North Korea's construction of its nuclear state identity can be observed in the context of the diplomatic revolution of 2018-2019. Uh, to break this down, basically, the diplomatic revolution of 1819 did not change the discourse. And to understand how North Korea basically reconciled the conflict with the US on the one hand and the high level summit diplomacy on the other hand, we need to understand that to North Korea, diplomacy with the US is seen as a continuation of war with other means. North Korea liter literally describes its relations to the US also during the time of 2018 and 2019 uh, in terms of a diplomatic war. As such, uh, high-level summit meetings are seen uh, one of the aspects uh, of this uh, diplomatic war, it leads with the uh, US. If we take a closer look uh, at both the discursive constructions and the performative enactments of its nuclear state identity, uh, since uh, the high-level summit meetings, we can simply see no widespread changes, both on the discursive level nor the performative level. This is not to say that uh, North Korean sources would not have changed the way it describes certain aspects of the US, especially the special relations between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, but it certainly did not change the overall a basic threat uh, perception uh, from the US. It does not change the nature uh, of the identity of both the US, the US and North Korea. Uh, and it remains basically on the same level or uh, st still stating that uh, the US constitutes the major threat for uh, North Korean 
uh, security and sovereignty. And this, of course, uh, has tremendous political consequences. Uh, and the challenges for the international community is a daunting one. Ultimately, we must pose the question how we can negotiate away a threat with a country that deems the related danger as so very vital to its very existence. So I see I already reached the time limits and I stop here and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Eric. Uh, thank you very much as always. Um, very insightful this. Uh, I of course know this, um, your take, your discursive or ideational approach on, on the matter at hand already and I'm always fascinated by that. And I do also agree with uh, Virginia that this really uh, fits well together with 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 her presentation. So I think there's a lot of um, material here um, to to discuss about, and that's what we are going to do. Um, I'd like now to invite Ed Griffith uh, from the University of Central Lancashire. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and first of all, yes, I'd also like to uh, thank the organisers of this conference. I think putting on something like this in these times is in itself an achievement. Uh, but to get this number of people together to be able to talk on these topics, I think uh, as academics, we're all grateful that we still have that chance to do this at this time of year. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you also to our speakers. Um, this is truly uh, the best way to start a Wednesday, uh, uh, my breakfast meeting, listening to you two talk on this. And I too agree that these two papers fit well together, although they approach things in slightly different ways. Uh, but there are some there are some important similarities in, in uh, some of the things that you've identified. Um, I'd say probably there are two important things. Um, the first one is a bit um, pessimistic, really, uh, which is uh, when we think about the future of the Korean Peninsula, I think um, many people like to try to work out how this is going to be resolved and where we're going to get to the resolution from. Um, the analysis that both of you provided suggests that this isn't something that's simple and easy or very close on the horizon. Um, and I, I think that's important if we're going to deal with this sensibly and seriously, that's probably an important thing that we have to grasp as analysts and as policymakers. Um, the second thing, obviously, Eric talked, uh, you know, a central part of his uh, analysis is about identity. Um, but actually, Virginie's final point um, about uh, the two careers being very different careers from the ones they were 70 years ago. I think that speaks very much to that. Um, without understanding the DPRK's sense of self and its national identity and the way that that is different from, it, from what we saw 70 years ago, uh, we're never going to make any sort of progress in terms of levels of reconciliation or, or, or progress towards peace. Um, Virginie, your uh, application of the frozen conflict model, I think this is, um, I think this is a really useful model uh, to look at in inter-Korean relations. Um, so often, you know, by no means all, but so often in analysis of inter-Korean relations, uh, the questions are framed around, maybe not quite this simplistically, but around the question of sort of when is unification going to happen or what is going to trigger the next war between the two. And it's almost like this dichotomy of the two. And I think the... Um, the application of this frozen conflict model sort of allows us a, a, a longer uh, a longer frame of reference to consider uh, the different sort of outcomes and possibilities and the way that it can evolve. Um, and I think uh, uh, I think you made an excellent point when you said that it's it's no longer enough to talk about simply the collapse of the DPRK or putting all of this down to the United States. We have to we have to think about this in sort of a more nuanced and more complex way. Um, I'm interested in, uh, when we get to the to more of the discussion, perhaps you can uh, expand more on this about, you, you cited various sort of catch-22 situations uh, throughout your analysis. And I, and I think th this in itself poses some interesting questions and I'm, I'm left, I'm genuinely just left pondering about this and I'd be interested for, you, for your thoughts that um, sort of the catch-22 in, the, uh, in the violent thawing and in the conflict withering they almost seem to sort of slightly contradict each other. So, um, <laughs> so which it, it, so the the fact that what we really need for conflict withering, which I think would be quite a desirable outcome, 
what we really need for conflict withering really is the removal of nuclear weapons. I mean, that's, it's not possible for conflict withering to take place without that. But actually, the existence of those nuclear weapons, I think you reasonably cited as one of the reasons that violent thawing is actually quite unlikely. So we're sort of left with this contradiction. And it's very, very hypothetical because it's quite clear that nuclear weapons are not going to disappear from the, the Korean Peninsula tomorrow. But if they were, I mean, is that going to enable the conflict withering or is that more likely to lead us to the violent thawing process, which obviously is, is quite undesirable? Um, so may maybe we can talk more about that when, when we come along. Um, Eric, uh, if I come back to your presentation, um, I really like this idea of uh, performative identity production and reproduction. I think it really does help us to understand the way that North Korea behaves. I actually think it goes beyond North Korea. Um, I, uh, I come from an international relations background and I, I try to write from a constructivist point of view. And uh, one of the criticisms of a constructivist approach to international relations is it quite often doesn't actually tell us very much about foreign policy. It's almost sort of notes things about countries without really giving us a framework for analysing foreign policy decision making. And I think that's where you're offering a real contribution here, because you're talking about um, this creation and recreation of threat as being inherent to the DPRK's identity but not only just to the sort of the way they see themselves, but that then has a direct impact on the way uh, that government procedures take place and policy is formulated. Um, so uh, that you said, I, I tried to write down your exact words, but I, I sort of slightly missed them. But you, you said uh, that basically the threat that it creates for itself is kind of the reason or the justification for the continued development and maintenance of its nuclear weapons. I mean, so, I mean that's absolutely key to understanding where the nuclear weapons program came from and why it's not going away sort of any time soon. Um, I also thought it was very interesting, you said, about the, the because this, this again challenges some of the assumptions about identity formation that we usually see, that you said that the identity, it doesn't rely on the recognition of others. So actually, uh, the, the DPRK doesn't need others to acknowledge that its nuclear weapons program is at a particular level. Simply the knowledge itself that it's done that is sufficient, which I think that's a really interesting, a really interesting thing to note. Um, I'm conscious that I'm only allowed five minutes, uh, so maybe I'll just... Uh, there was something that I was intrigued about. Um, you titled this as an emerging nuclear state identity, and I wondered about the use of the word emerging, because certainly what you describe is an identity that is already there. I mean, of course, it's, it's being constantly reproduced and perhaps updated and, and developing in that way. Um, but I wondered about the just, just. I mean, this might be slightly semantic, but I think it it probably does have implications for the rest of the analysis. If we if if we talk about it emerging, it sort of suggests that it's not quite there, and this is something that's on the horizon in the future. But that I mean, that's not quite the message I took from the rest of your analysis. So I I, I wonder if maybe you want to expand on that. Um, I think we should stop here. You can add up right. later on if if needed. Thank I'll, you. I'll intervene later. Thanks, Hans. Yes, please do so. Thank you very much, Ed. And now it's the, the turn for He Gyeong Chang from the University of Duisburg Essen. Please fire away. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to exchange thoughts with other scholars in Europe uh, on possible solutions to North Korean nuclear issue and on establishing peace on the Korean Peninsula. I pretty much enjoyed reading these two papers, uh, Dr. Grizalik. Uh, summarize very well the historical dynamics, how the North Korean issues have shifted into regional issues or, or so-called meso or, uh, yeah, meso, chrono, meso issues uh, chronologically. Based on the notion of a, a front comfort, uh, three possible options are suggested. I totally agreed with that uh, among those violent throwing is a very unlikely option on the Korean peninsula and that the peaceful resolution should be taken. In the sense, you suggested some possible measures to, uh, for example, lifting the international sanctions slowly. In this regard, I'm curious what uh, you think about the position of the European Union. Do you think that the, uh, from the perspective of the EU, EU this is a viable option? And now, uh, as for my former colleague Eric's presentation, uh, I pretty much enjoyed uh, reading this article and pretty much agree with his analysis based on the 
uh, concept of discursive construction uh, nuclear state identity in North Korea, which means that uh, North Korea develops nuclear weapons not only for deterrence but also for performative identity through identifying itself against the threats uh, from outside. As a complementary perspective, I would like to point out the threats which uh, North Korea has perceived from the external factors or how the other's behavior also affected to the formation of North Korea's nuclear state uh, identity. I would argue that the uh, continuous failure of negotiations concerning the North Korean nuclear issue and the mutual distrust resulted from these repeated failures have uh, driven North Korea to seek its uh, nuclear state identity. In other words, North Korea constituted its identity not uh, only by a unilateral interpretation of the other, but also is a result of mutual uh, interpretation of each other and the recipro reciprocal uh, perception. In this context, I'd like to suggest looking back the historical negotiations during almost 30 years. Uh, as you know very well, the, the 1994 agreed uh, framework was the optimal chance to resolve the nuclear uh, issue in North Korea for the first place. In the 2000 uh, joint communique, they uh, set up the detailed process to normalize political, economic, and diplomatic relations but after uh, Bush labeled North Korea uh, part of the axis of evil together with Iraq and uh, suspecting North Korea of developing highly enriched uranium, all the agreements uh, were halted. Uh, secondly, the joint statement of September 2005 at the six party talks and the action plan for the implementation of these agreements in 2007 were also halted by the imposing economic sanctions on North Korea because of the uh, Banco Delta Asia affair and uh, 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 strategic patience policy of the Obama administration and the South Korea's containment policy. Uh, eventually, at the uh, uh, last Hanoi meeting, the negotiation has remained in deadlock because the Bolton's disturbance to break the small deal uh, here is one important disputable issue uh, regarding the uh, North Korean nuclear issue is the sequence of the denuclearization and uh, sanctions relief or security guarantee of North Korea's regime. Also, the view on the range of the denuclearization and the definition of the denuclearization uh, varies. Uh, the United States had always the uh, suspicion that the North Korea will not give up its nuclear program. Vice versa, North Korea had always the suspicion that their system cannot be guaranteed if they dismantle all the nuclear facilities. This kind of uh, 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 dilemma and this uh, uh, repeated failure of negotiations, both sides strengthened the mistrust each other. And especially for the North Korea, they lose the chance to reform their economic development strategy. These circumstances pushes, I think, North Korea to keep developing the nuclear state identity. But uh, if we uh, see the uh, last uh, statement from the Kim Yo Jong on uh, July 10th, 2020, uh, she stated that the, uh, North Korea would resume negotiations only if the United States dismissed its hostile policy. In other words, it made it clear that a new approach is necessary to solve this stalemate. I think this might be the last chance to solve the North Korean nuclear issue. And it is not difficult to see that if once again the stress patience policies will be taken, or as a hardline position of denuclearization of North Korea as a precondition will be maintained, then North Korea could be even more reluctant to give up uh, its nuclear state identity and uh, may choose uh, China as its political and uh, economic partner more than before. Uh, as a possible result of this would be a nuclear arms race in the uh, uh, East Asian region which means that the security relations in East Asia would fall into a new Cold War vortex. 
Against this backdrop, I would like to pose the following questions to Eric. Uh, do you think the North Korea's nuclear state identity will uh, change over time or is it fixed? If you think it might uh, change, then uh, what uh, do you think are the conditions? What would make this change possible? And lastly, under the, this increasing competition between China and the United States, what options would be taken by the North Korea? Actually, I'd like to talk about this uh, questions uh, with all other scholars together. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another uh, round of questions here. Um, and now we turn to Lonnie Edge from Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. Please go ahead. Lonnie? You hearing us? Oh, he's, he's frozen. No, no, no. Lonnie Edge, Mr. Mr. Edge, are you? I'm writing to him now. Oh, that's yeah, wonderful. No, thank thank you. you. Can you hear me? Yeah, that was fine. Hello? Yeah. Is that Can you, you Lonnie? That's me. Oh, you're frozen. We have to de-ice you somehow. And now you're <laughs> back again, alive. Well, I am. Okay, I wonderful. Go ahead. Now I think it's fine. Okay. So apparently, uh, I'm not sure if the technical difficulties are on my end or on Zoom's end, but if I cut out, I apologize. Um, I'm really happy to be here today um, and uh, put names to faces to some people who uh, I've had an a email relationship with through uh, my managing editor role at North Korean Review. And uh, it's good to see uh, Sarah and Virginia again, uh, their editorial board members of NKR. Um, anyways, uh, everyone else says it's morning. For me, it is evening and almost dinner time. Um, moving along to my five minutes of comments. Um, so when I first read uh, the, the file that uh, Professor Lim sent me uh, from uh, Virginie, uh, this this idea of a frozen conflict, it, it brought to mind uh, an interview I did one time with a, a prospective intern, and I asked her why she wanted to be an intern at our journal and why she was interested in North Korean studies. And she told me that one of her professors had told her that North Korean studies is a frozen wasteland of shattered academic dreams. Um, now, I, I think I think we all would beg to differ about that a little bit, but it is uh, interesting that based on the armistice and this technicality that there's still war on the Korean Peninsula, we are still dealing with the same problem 70 years after it originated. Um, so when I first started to think about frozen conflict and I, I read uh, Virginie's uh, notes that she sent, um, it kind of feels like maybe an ice age has set in here. Um, so, but one thing about the frozen conflict, it, 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 it centers on this idea that there's a conflict, but it failed to reach a peaceful or stable stage. And um, I can tell you right now that sitting here in Seoul, I don't think any South Korean feels that there's a lot of instability going on in their day-to-day -day life with North Korea. And that's because there's the alliance, there's the nuclear umbrella, there's all forms of deterrence that have prevented uh, the, the, re, uh, the reinitialization of, of some sort of hot conflict or war here on the peninsula. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a little curious about how this frozen conflict, what is the definition of, of conflict? Because um, the adversarial relationship between North and South Korea or North Korea with the US, uh, et cetera, um, definitely there, there's a perception of, of an adversary or enemy, but I'm not sure if, if, if it's a conflict. I, I don't, I, I, I kind of have been waffling and, and trying to mull it over. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure if the armistice itself is not a form of stability. 
So I, I think there needs to be something a little bit unpackaged to somehow explain how a frozen conflict, what what aspect of it is is conflict and how it's frozen. I, I think. Um, also, <laughs> I know that Virginie said it's not appropriate to talk about collapse, and I promise you, I am not a collapsist. But I don't think we can just ignore it. Um, I, I kind of feel like somehow collapse. She in in she mentions that in in the idea of conflict withering, it would involve some sort of change in North Korea, and it would have to be at such a level where they would suddenly open themselves up economically, or or something good would have to happen uh, to to make them for for me to envision that type of a change. And in South Korea, the term that they use for a collapse in North Korea is actually called kupyeon sate, which is just sudden change. So I think as much as I don't believe a collapse will happen, somehow uh, it, I, I think it's kind of an elephant in the room that, that needs to be discussed in terms of how it would differ from the withering conflict or how a withering conflict does not somehow uh, encompass the idea of, of a collapse. Um, beyond that, I, I, I liked the, you know, the descriptive empirical work. Um, I, I think it kind of help shows, it helps illustrate how the, it, the, this confrontation on the Korean peninsula has shifted from something that is, is much more kinetic to something that is more of a diplomatic infighting, as, as, as she said. Um, but I'm kind of curious about how we ended up in this, in this state of, of frozenness. So um, that's, that's something that I would like to ask, and, and I, I, I don't know the answer, but uh, perhaps Virginie has, has a better idea about that. Um, then regarding uh, Professor Balbach's uh, presentation, um, obviously while we're giving our presentations and, and our panels going on, there are other panels going on put on because this, this conference is uh, paid for because South Korea is very heavily invest, invested in the idea of unification. So railroads, electric grid, infrastructure, but for me, the most important part of any type of reunification would have to be, can everyone still hear me? Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, one minute left. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just, I thought maybe we were frozen, um, <laughs> is identity. And there can't be any type of real reunification that benefits North and South Koreans without there being some way of addressing that over 70 years, they've become very different people. Um, now, uh, one, one thing, obviously, uh, Eric has, has decided to deal with how nuclear weapons have been enshrined in the North Korean constitution and have, and have somehow become synonymous with North Koreanness. Um, and I like the idea of a nuclear test as a performance. It, it obviously it, it brings some really interesting image, images to mind. But one thing I wonder about that performance is, is this performance or signaling for DPRK citizens or for foreign consumption? And um, the other thing I thought of was that Sungun uh, predates nuclear weapons in North Korea by a, you know, a good decade or more. Um, and that already had a very militaristic North Korean government needs to protect the, Korean, the North Korean people uh, aspect of North Korean identity. So does this nuclear identity represent a shift in DPRK identity? And if so, how? Um, and then last, if I could throw in a last question, I would, I'd yes, like please. to know what he thinks that this means for DPRK's relations with other countries. Great. Thank you, uh, Lonnie, to Afternoon Korea. <laughs> we will now turn to Sarah Sun back in the, uh, yeah, still in the EU, but anyway, so in Europe uh, from the University of Sheffield, she uh, was able to join us. I'm very happy that we are having you here. Now, please go ahead with your discussion, Sarah. Thank you. Can, uh, can I be heard? Yes. 
Yes, great. Thank you um, for for waiting for me to, to drop in. Um, and thank you to the organisers for having me and also to Sojin Lim for organising uh, this particular panel. As Again, it's nice to see some familiar faces and to put faces to names that I've heard about and read about uh, uh, to some extent over the years. Um, I did enjoy the, the two presentations today. I did miss little snippets of them as I was in transit, but I did read the, 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 the papers that came through. Um, and I think, again, I agree that there is a really useful connection between the two um, and that I think to some extent um, Dr. Baalbach's analysis and the theories that he applies do provide some really helpful ways of understanding and answering some of the questions and problems raised in, in Virginie's uh, presentation. And I appreciated Virginie's helpful breakdown of the ways the inter-Korean conflict is, is frozen um, and the possibilities for the thawing or the withering of this conflict. And it was interesting to look at that table that, that came through on the, on the paper to look at the history of the events and how they're coded to show the different levels of interaction over the time and the shift that's taken place uh, post-Cold War. But of course, this analysis doesn't provide us with this magic formula for a clear way out of this um, frozen conflict, but I thought there was some really useful um, analysis of the likelihood of the different scenarios. Um, but it also, I think, serves as a reminder that, you know, whether it's probable, possible, impossible or not, that, you know, one of the least undesirable routes out is that which somehow facilitates these sort of gradual forms of thawing via engagement whatever that might mean to you. Um, engagement, which um, there's actually a panel at the same time yesterday um, at this conference, um, which looked at the way that engagement specifically is hindered by the continuing sanctions regime. Um, and, and we know well that the ethics and effectiveness of sanctions and their impact on the economy and development in North Korea more generally are critical questions when we're thinking about how we might facilitate this movement towards either peaceful thawing or gradual withering. And the speakers yesterday proposed a number of options on this point about sanctions. Um, and, and one of the ones that sort of they kept returning to and that has, has a sort of come out in this discussion as well is that being the idea that, you know, we perhaps remove this, uh, the, the complete irreversible nuclear dismantlement or disarmament as this immovable condition for lifting any sanctions and instead, and instead, accept North Korea's nuclear identity for the time being with a view to stage sanctions relief, you know, under certain um, conditions of transparency and accountability. And then look to later revisit the nuclear question. Um, and I'd be interested to hear Virginie's thoughts on the geopolitical implications of attempting something like this and under what conditions, if any, she thinks this might become possible. Obviously, we have a very enthusiastic and willing government in Seoul right now, um, which is bending over backwards to appease North Korea, but you know, this just isn't making the difference um, that you know the leadership hoped it might. And then linking to um, Eric's presentation, I think we're reminded that denuclearization becomes an increasingly challenging ambition as the fact of possessing nuclear weapons and therefore being a nuclear power becomes more deeply embedded in North Korea's identity narrative. And I'm very sympathetic to this, this sort of framework, this way of looking at things. I also write from um, a constructivist perspective and look at the ideational roots of, of foreign policy. And, you know, this isn't a narrative, I think, this nuclear identity narrative isn't one that I think can be overturned overnight at least not without extremely good reasons and usually in a, in a, stage, a staged and scaffolded manner. Um, and this perhaps pushes us further towards needing to consider accepting North Korea's nuclear identity in order to make any progress towards any form of nonviolent thawing. Um, I did really appreciate um, Eric's analysis. I think it is a really helpful way of looking at the way the possession of nuclear weapons has become woven into North Korea's ontological as well as its physical security. And I certainly agree that the strategy North Korea has followed to do this has been calculated, it's been precise and very effective um, in terms of embedding this nuclear identity into its historical narrative of itself and also how it sees itself moving forward into the future. And with all that said, I, I wondered whether... Um, uh, Eric sees his framework for analysing North Korea's nuclear identity is perhaps useful for also interpreting the place of the inter-Korean conflict or the, the frozenness of the conflict in North Korea's identity. And I think several of the speakers, including Lonnie just now, have already sort of alluded to this, this idea that, you know, the anything but the status quo may somehow be destabilising or threatening in and of itself. 
So I wondered whether Eric might go so far as to say that an end to the conflict via, for example, the peaceful thawing scenario remains unrealized precisely because so much of both North and South Korea state identity narratives are, are tied to the existence of the conflict and the division. Um, just looking at some of the literature on identity and long running or, or these cold, frozen conflicts, um, you know, could, could, could we say perhaps that the idea of no longer being in a conflict state is, is an uncertainty, it's, a, it's an unknowable thing, um, which, uh, you know, it threatens the narrative that's told by the state to the world and to its people, that it's destabilizing. Um, and that is maybe what makes it so difficult to take genuine, tangible, um, scheduled steps um, towards detailed plans for, for you know, any kind of peace agreement or, or distinct steps towards overcoming the conflict. I think I'm probably out of time now, so I'll leave it there for now. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your discussion points here, for your questions and comments. Now we uh, go down to Italy. Marco Milani from the University of Bologna, please. Uh, thank you, Agnes. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Good. So good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are right now. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organization for this wonderful panel that they were able to put together in this very complicated situation. And I'd like to thank the two presenters for these two very interesting and thought-provoking presentations. And I think that it's really important to stress the fact that both these presentations address, address what is the traditional security concern, but from a very innovative perspective. And I think it's very important, uh, also by, uh, both by analyzing different levels in the, in the so-called frozen conflict between the two Koreas, and also introducing non-material factors. And I think this is another very, very important aspect. I will start with the Virginie's paper, and I really like the idea of introducing this category of frozen conflict that reminded me a lot of the, of the concept of strategic rivalry in, uh, in international relations theory, and I think it's very important because it helps us to go beyond the paradigm of war or unification and to analyze the situation as it is today. And I also really enjoyed all the division, the categorization of all the main events that took place in, uh, in terms of inter-Korean relations and also including other important actors in the region. I think it's very important and it's also very useful. So the first question I'd like to ask to Virginie is if she can elaborate a little bit more on how she did this categorization about the methodology of how uh, she decided to divide these events in categories. Some of these events, to me, it sounds like they are on the border between micro and meso, or meso and macro. So I'd like to know more about the methodology of this categorization. This is the first thing. The, um, the second point I'd like to, uh, to ask to Virginie is that I noticed that a lot of the micro um, events, the, the, the events that are listed as micro level, are uh, concentrated in a first phase in the 50s, 60s, and in general during the Cold War period. So my question is, what about inter-Korean relations, all the events that took place in the early 2000s? So uh, how can inter-Korean relations impact on this frozen conflict? Uh, not only the early 2000s, but what happened in recent years. So I'd like to elaborate a little bit more on the role of inter-Korean relations as micro-level events in this uh, frozen conflict. And the last point that I'd, I'd like to ask to Virginie is that uh, at some point uh, she mentioned the fact that a sudden change, a non-gradual change in North Korea uh, should necessarily lead to violent thawing. So my question is, is that a way that like a sudden change, a non-gradual change in, in the domestic system in North Korea cannot, can lead to something different to uh, um, from uh, a violent thaw. Uh, as for Eric's paper, I really, really enjoyed reading Eric's uh, presentation and listening to him. And I think it's very important to broaden the analysis of traditional security aspects like nuclear weapons uh, beyond military aspects. And introducing non-material factor and identity in particular is of utmost importance, uh, in my opinion. 
And I totally agree with him about the idea of construction and reconstruction of the United States as a threat for North Korea, because it's also justification for this defensive approach to nuclear weapons that is one of the key aspects of uh, North Korean nuclear identity. And I really also like the idea of introducing these per performative aspects of, uh, of um, identity construction and consolidation. So my, my, my question, my first question is, what is the audience of this performance? Is this a domestic audience or is this an international audience? If we have both together, what is the goal, what is the strategy of the regime towards the first one and towards the second one? Is that any different? This leads me to another consideration that is, uh, what is the relation between domestic and international dimensions in this? Is I personally believe there is a strong component of domestic legitimacy in building up this uh, nuclear state identity. But is this also there is, is there also um, another aspect connected to international status uh, in the international community, for example, as a, as a, an important and power and actor in the region? So what I, I'd like to ask him what. What does it think about this um, dynamics between domestic and international level in, in, in terms of nuclear state identity construction? And my last question for Eric uh, is, um, do you think there is a dynamic in this process of construction and consolidation, starting from the second half of the 2000s until today? Do you see any change in the way in which the regime has tried to construct and consolidate this identity. For example, in recent years, it seems that uh, the regime is trying to adopt a more acceptable uh, behavior international in the international community. So from the international aspect, do you think that we can see a dynamic in this process? Or uh, do you think that uh, in, the, in the past years, we've seen like the, the same process of cons uh, construction and consolidation of the identity uh, going on? Yeah, I think that's it for me. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, I just realized we are jumping from islands to peninsulas. Um, now we are on the it Italian peninsula. We're coming back now finally to the continent uh, and to Nicolas Levy from the Institute of Mediterranean and Oriental Cultures in Poland. So please go ahead. Good morning to all of you. I'm happy to meet you again. Some of you had the occasion to meet uh, in Seoul already. Some of you we email, like with Loni, regarding North Korean review. Um, first, uh, I would like to thank Sojin Lim and those who uh, contributed to uh, our today event. So I also would like to thank uh, Virginia Gjelcek for a wonderful uh, presentation and Mr. Eric Barba from uh, Germany also, so I really appreciate it. And what was the most important, uh, in my opinion, is the concept of the frozen war. And concerning that point, I would like to point out some issues concerning a different frozen or cold war in the framework of US and China relations. Uh, I get that uh, you noticed a few months ago, a few months ago, exactly if I remember, let, let me check it here. Yeah, that was on the 20 May, a report of 16 pages was issued in the US and uh, by the White, White House here in the US and was entitled the United States strategic approach to the People's Republic of China. This is a global strategy concerning the future relation of the United States of America with China. And in this report, it was indicated or mentioned that China, and we are talking about of an official document, constituted a challenge to our values, which means that the commercial war which is existing between China and the US seems to be more 
a kind of uh, civilization conflict where we try to mix commercial issues, diplomatic related, for instance, to the Korean Peninsula, but also cultural elements. A second point that I would like to underline is that in this report, Xi Jinping, the head of state of China, was not called a president, but listen, a general secretary of the Communist Party of China. So again, it was underlined here that China and its leadership is different from what we had uh, previously. Why I'm discussing about that? I'm discussing about this point because from one side, we have the concept of Cold War, Frozen War. By the way, can we say that both are the same? And on the other side, we know that the US are using the Korean Peninsula as a tool, as an instrument to increase its power in Asia. So the US authorities are trying to, let's say, uh, create some antagonisms between its country and uh, China. These elements are also important in the context of the future American elections. Because we know the opinion of Donald Trump regarding the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that just before the elections in November, in November on the first uh, Tuesday of November, uh, we will see that the US will make a strong move regarding the Korean Peninsula. Will it be a kind of positive, like in the past, maybe some kind of summit between some leaders of the US and North Korea? Or maybe we will face with a totally different situation where the policy of the US will be much more aggressive than in the past. Also, uh, this concept of uh, frozen war between China and um, the US may be even enlarged if Joe Biden will be also, uh, will be chosen as the future president of the US. Why? Because if we again check documents or opinions of Joe Biden related to uh, China several times, Jobina, Joe Biden, excuse me, called Xi Jinping a thug when speaking about human rights issues in China. So in other words, the, the frozen war that uh, we have in the context of the Korean pens, Peninsula may be also impacted by the future relations of the US with China, but also regarding relations between China and South Korea. And also here, we need to take in account the former or the postponed or uh, rather the future visit of Xi Jinping to South Korea, which is supposed to take place within two months. So from my point of view, these are my comments. So I would like here what I wanted to say is that the concept of frozen war is extremely important, uh, not only in the context of the Korean Peninsula, but also within the framework of Chinese and US relations. Thank you again. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, very, very good. Um, so this uh, really uh, <clears throat> is, was were very good uh, last comments and questions of a row of uh, discussants here um, dealing with the two presentations. And uh, we have now broken the eyes, at least the eyes of this panel. And I will now ask the two presenters uh, to give us their feedback, their thoughts on the comments and questions. And we will not start in reverse order. Uh, but we will start with Virginie first. And, but before we do so, I would uh, like to announce once more the 
after we heard the reactions um, or while you're listening um, to what the presenters have to say. Also, the audience uh, can now via the QR code and the link um, participate in the panel. You can send us the questions, which I will then forward to the panelists, to the panel to discuss here. So you, uh, even if you're in the audience now outside of this uh, uh, panel, if you are the other, um, you can engage with the discussion here and I ask you to please do so. So while you are thinking and writing your questions to uh, via the link, um, we will now uh, listen to Virginia, please. Uh, uh, what do you think about the comments and questions you received? Oh, thank you, Hannes. Uh, how how long uh, do I have? Is just uh, five minutes? I wasn't quite sure from the um, five minutes. That's, is good. that's yes. a very very good point. Let's start with five minutes, and we'll we'll see from there. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, you thank you for your great moderating skills. It it reminded me of the Eurovision. You know, um, uh, and I think those those who, who who are familiar with this will, and who have probably missed it, you know, this this may, you know, there was a little bit of nostalgia. You know, let's go to Italy now. Let's go to, you know, let's go to uh, uh, to Poland. Let's go to the UK. So, anyway, so I'll, uh, thank you so much for for all the comments and all the thoughts. I'll I'll pick my battles here and and try to to give a few um, a few a few points. I, I think I will maybe um, group um, Ed and and Sarah's questions to some extent together uh, because the, the, there is this the, this question uh, around um you know the, the, the conundrum of those nuclear weapons and you know the cash 22 and what we are willing uh, in a way to accept and and what we are not willing to uh, to accept um so uh, to go back to that point um, um ed was saying well you know if, if we are looking at conflict withering then you know we, we need the nuclear weapons to go so i guess my i uh, my, my always my my initial reaction to this is do we really uh, one of the things that i've 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 talked about for, for quite quite a while. I remember presenting on something similar at the the European Consortium for Political Research uh, in Iceland, like you know, eight years ago or so, presenting on this very notion of. Um, to some extent, disarming uh, the DPRK at least politically by by giving it um, what they perhaps don't expect, which is to be accepted as a de facto nuclear power, because this is where they are, you know, at, at this point. But what this means, if you say, okay, fine, we agree, we accept that you have nuclear weapons, but now let's actually talk about this responsibly. And let's talk about managing, you know, this stock. Let's talk about this, you know, let's manage this via global governance. Uh, and then what would be this reaction? And I think this, this goes back to, to, to the question that Sarah had also around this, this, this nuclear identity to, to, to regulate. And does, is, this, is this a way forward? Is this, it might be something that we cannot accept because, you know, just as, you know, many countries uh, often say, well, we don't negotiate with, ter with terrorists. We don't accept those kind of things. This is this red line to some extent for many countries that they are unwilling to accept that North Korea is going to um, to, to to become to, or is to some extent a, a, a nuclear state. So I think there's there's a very important point here. You know, is there a way by actually engaging the DPRK on on a different avenue, which is about you know uh, uh, managing this uh, through 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 global governance, without talking about things that have infuriated the DPRK in the past? Uh, you know, CVID, not COVID. You know, CVID, complete verifiable and irreversible dismantlement, because you know this was. Um, a problem long time ago, it was gone and then it came back, you know, the U.S. has been using it. This had been, you know, uh, an important an, an important um, uh, and problematic point. So I, I guess I'll, 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 I'll leave that for further question to, to some extent. Um, 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 uh, Hikim Chong posted a very interesting question to me about um, about the role of the, the European Union as well. And, and it just happened that I, I, I wrote a chapter a, a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago for, you know, this uh, upcoming uh, um, EU DPRK um, volume that, that's being written by uh, a large number of, of us uh, in, um, in Europe. And what is quite interesting is, you know, there's Europe and there's European countries. And, and those are two different things. If we talk about the European Union, um, actually, the European Union since 2006 
has followed on, followed with the, the UN sanction, you know, followed with UNSC uh, 1695 and, and 1718 after 2006, has also imposed autonomous uh, sanctions with travel ban. It has suspended its political dialogue with the DPRK since 2015. And all in all, there is a very short history of engagement because the, the, the EU only officially recognized the DPRK in 2001. And by 2005, some of the dialogues and the sanctions you and came about. So there's, there's little weight, all in all. What is more important, I think, is the individual relationship that some European countries have uh, with the DPRK. Uh, and you know that actually chose to uh, to to maintain despite despite the sanction. Um, so um, I, I think that there, there, there's there's a, a question there which which um, you know, we can go back to official EU uh, policy documents. You know the, the EAS has a policy of critical engagement combined with pressure through sanctions. So they talk about you know smart sanction essentially, um, and and that's not quite likely to um, uh, to change. Um, just on uh, uh, I think I'm almost out of time. I just uh, wanted to kind of uh, go back to this this notion of of conflict that uh, Loni was was asking me to to unpack. Um, and th there's more, you know, be behind all of that. Uh, uh, obviously, going back to the conflict resolution literature, and so you know, what I I do when I base myself when I do this type of research is really go back to the field which is my field, which is which is conflict resolution. I mean, this is my 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 training originally. You know, I are in conflict resolution, so I go back to, you know, Charles Cartman definition of conflict in the 1950s, where you need a crisis uh, that has an element of threat. Uh, but there's also some very interesting thing, you know, Robert Ted Robert Gur's uh, uh, understanding of content in collectivities, and also uh, uh, Colares's uh, um, idea of of strategic rivalry, which actually Marco mentioned uh, as well, and I was going to, to to talk about that as well and, and make this link. So I think there, there's, you know, we, we cannot quite, you know, easily say, well, what is a conflict? Really, I think it's a collection of of um, uh, contentious points uh, here. I think one of the very important uh, uh, points uh, was was made by Marco about you know the uh, the category the methodological point on you know the meso micro and and all of that and so obviously this was made with you know long coding over time of you know fifty years or so. What I do with with this uh, is usually I you know I code out of um, out of North Korean uh, news, but also out of uh, obviously you know uh, uh, well. Re real event and all of that. I spend a lot of time uh, coding those types of stuff uh, and base myself out of um, Hollett's framework of uh, micro, me mas meso and, uh, uh, and macro. So, uh, you know, maybe maybe something to, to look at a bit more, a uh, uh, bit more in depth. But I think I'll just finish on, on, one, on, on one point. You know, you were suggesting uh, the, um, how can, you know, the the importance of this inter-Korea uh, focus and how we, we seem to have more of those other actors, how this had been kind of, you know, uh, taken away. And I think this is actually because of the expansion of actors. It is because of, you know, uh, the openness, the, the, the development of new relationship, PRC and ROK uh, relationship, for example, but also ROK Japan relationship and all of that. So something that really started as an in-Korean issues has just, you know, expanded uh, to, through, through global governance and and the focus has been kind of taken away and i think actually that's that's a problem to some extent one of the things that was very 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 glad uh, to see at the the olympics southern olympics was this rapprochement that was recentering things on inter-korean issues and then this was hijacked by donald trump and his summit and all of that and then we know that we knew that this was going to go nowhere and you know because we understand the dynamics and you know, you have to plan before you start to talk to uh, to, to people uh, just two two very quick thoughts to uh, uh, to finish uh, on on Nicolas' point uh, about um, about China. It just really reminded your comment really reminded me of a, of a talk that Barry Buzan gave uh, in Nottingham actually in 2013, and now this is very interesting. I was I, I was lucky to be there, uh, and he's talking about the concept of cold peace which I think goes back to a lot of what you're saying when he talks to China. He, he's, you know, especially talking about cold peace when, when he mentions China. This idea that, you know, we're in this kind of uncomfortable uh, situation and we have all those, those things. So it's not cold war anymore and it's not full war and it's, a, and it's not peace, but it's uncomfortable kind of peace. So I guess I'll, I'll go to that. Um, the last thing, I think, one of the things that we all 
talk about, it seems, and I think we are all involved in engaging with the DPRK and the DPRK's narrative and the type of ideas. And I think this goes back to, I don't know who said that, perhaps Ed uh, was saying this, that you know we need to understand what's going on within the DPRK. Uh, and I remember last year when I was in, in Pyongyang in, in June, um, asking uh, uh, people about about Donald Trump, because I've been really curious about this 180 degree, you know, things. how can you, you know, uh, talk about an, a lifelong enemy uh, uh, and then suddenly, you know, have this, this big screen, you know, in front of Pyongyang Station and broadcast, you know, a summit and say, well, now the U.S. is kind of our friend. Uh, and actually, it goes back to, uh, to, to Eric's point about the fact that uh, this is a part of, of the diplomatic engagement. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, this, this is, uh, that suddenly the US is, is friend. And, and the, the one of the uh, person that I was talking, North Korean person I was talking about, this, you know, told me, oh, he's just, he's just a buffoon. Um, uh, they use the word buffoon talking about, about uh, Donald Trump. So there seem to be a complete lack of credibility uh, when it comes to, um, to what, or at least they were able to see very transparently what what uh, Donald Trump was was perhaps trying trying to do. So I guess I'll just leave it there. I think this opens maybe okay. more cans of worms, uh, frozen cans of worms. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, very very interesting. And recently, Trump said um, when he was saying he received the the, the letters from from Kim Jong Un, which he he uh, called love letters. He was just being sarcastic. So all performance. And that uh, connects very well to, to Eric Balbach, uh, who is now uh, ready to give his answers, please. Yeah, I, thank you very much for the, uh, the very helpful question, which, immediate, which are, will help me to, to go forward with this, with this topic. I want to address as much as I can, uh, starting with Ed's comment uh, on, or your notion on, on how I use the word emerging nuclear state identity. And I agree with you that in its current state, North Korea's nuclear state identity is not in the process of emerging anymore. It is there to stay. Uh, what I wanted to make clear here, I used the term emerging firstly in the first publication when I mainly used the historical perspective showing how this whole uh, identity emerged and developed over time but I fully agree with you that uh, in its current state, if we just look at it uh, as it is right now, uh, emerging is probably uh, the, wrong, the wrong word. Uh, what I want to make uh, clear, though, is that we have to be aware that this uh, identity will always be in the process of, of becoming, so to say. It's, it's never fully established. Uh, the process of constructing its nuclear state identity is never completed, so to argue for a dynamic perspective here is, is important, but I agree with you that going forward, uh, using emerging is probably misleading. To Higyong Chang's uh, argument, uh, you asked if North Korea's state identity is, will change over time or if it's somehow fixed. And I would say, given that uh, at least in a crit from a critical perspective, uh, identity is always constituted in relation to difference. And so the foundations of identity are driven by the interpretative politics of language. Changing an identity from this perspective basically requires a change, a whole uh, transformation of the underlying discourse, uh, which I simply have not seen yet. And uh, I agree with what Virgin just said. You know, there, there can be Donald Trump posters or uh, uh, in, in Pyongyang, but that does not mean uh, that anything uh, of the underlying discourse uh, basically uh, fully changes, and it hasn't uh, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, the modes of representation of self and other pretty much remained the same. And we also, of course, have to be very careful if we talk about North Korean representation uh, of the US. There is not the US in North Korea's representation. There is uh, uh, differentiation between representational modes of, let's say, the U.S. population and uh, uh, U.S. decision makers, even within the class of decision makers, North Korean sources differentiate, as we just saw about the representation of Donald Trump on the one hand uh, and North Korea uh, and the U.S. foreign 
minister on the other hand, which uh, can be very different. So I would say uh, identity is never fixed and it's bound to change over time as well, uh, depending on how the discourse changes, of course. Uh, Lonnie asked about the signaling. Uh, is it for domestic audience or for foreign audience? And I would say it depends on uh, the performance and it depends on uh, kind of the, the way the discourse is structured. Uh, of course, there is a, an, an internal dynamic to this, a strong internal dynamic to it. Uh, I would argue that even uh, an authoritarian, totalitarian, post-authoritarian, whatever you will call it, state as North Korea, uh, when it comes to revolutionary decisions as developing uh, nuclear weapons in a time of a structural economic, uh, sometimes even social crisis, even a state like North Korea needs to explain to a certain degree to its audience, to its domestic audience, why such uh, uh, a revolutionary program as the nuclear weapons program uh, must be paid for, why, uh, these, uh, why this uh, program is important. Uh, and in this regard, of course, the signaling for the North Korea's own audience, for the DPRK's audience, is very important. Other elements, especially performative elements, if we think about the destruction of Pungiri uh, uh, testing site, these are, of course, clearly uh, a show of project for the foreign audience to invite foreign uh, media reporters to it, to bring them overnight to this site and to let them film the, uh, the destruction of the testing site or partial destruction, at least. This, of course, is a signaling to the foreign audience and they are very aware very aware in, in Pyongyang of the power of such images. Uh, you asked about uh, Songun, uh, and I fully agree with you that much of uh, or, or elements of the nuclear state identity construction make recourses to, to what Songun discourse already stated, and that is due to the fact that uh, discourses have history and the North Korean nuclear state identity regularly uses those positive and negative historical reference points, historical analogies that are drawn on basically to make contemporary events understandably to ins inscribe meaning to contemporary events. Uh, even though identity ev evolves only within a certain range of uh, var variation, I would argue that uh, the nuclear state identity, of course, also subsumes basic elements of previous or surrounding discourses like the Songun discourse. To Sarah's point, uh, if we can use this framework also for inter-Korean relations, I would uh, say Roland Bleicher in his, in his book Divided Korea Toward a Culture of Reconciliation has already begun uh, doing precisely that. He places peninsular tensions in the context of a struggle over competing forms of Korean identity. Uh, but I would uh, argue, and I would fully agree with Sarah's point, there is much more uh, to be done when it comes to the representation of the other. Uh, of course, uh, it is possible that representations of the other changes, and history has shown this time and time again. If we just go back to uh, European history, uh, we can see this very clearly. And I would even argue Europe shows us or, or gives us an example that the other can even or, or must not even be another state. Uh, if we think back to post-war European developments, we can say that Europe's own history as a conflict-ridden continent with antagonistic relations between European countries has been or has become a major other in the construction of post-war European identity. So basically, Europe's own history became the other against which uh, contemporary identity uh, was developed. Uh, yeah, I think I leave it at this and, and come back maybe in the context of other questions uh, already over time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, so I, I haven't received uh, yet any questions from, from the audience, which is uh, good and bad at the same time. Good because we have more time to, to go back and forth between the panelists and the discussants. And... Um, I don't want to say bad, uh, but <laughs> it's a challenge because, of course, we'd like to exchange also with um, all the other uh, listeners or those uh, now watching um, this panel. So uh, I hope it's not a technical issue. 
but until now I have no questions received. And uh, But as I said, we welcome very much all your questions and comments from the virtual audience. But um, yeah, I'll see uh, Nicholas. Um, he wants to come back to some uh, aspect. And I also ask the others and invite the other discussants if um, if you still have questions, other comments, reactions to what has been said now. So please give me a sign and um, then I'll, I'll let you speak. We will start with Nicholas and then Virginie. Um, and uh, this is my list for now. But first, Nicholas, please. Yes, so the Polish team wants to say something. Amazing. <laughs> so uh, I would like, I have a question toward learning. And uh, my question is, uh, in, as now for me, it's impossible to go to South Korea, let's say for technical reasons, I would like to ask you, can we say that the population in South Korea as of 2020 uh, is more interested in North Korean issues, let's say, for instance, human rights uh, issue than in the past, or we still see a low interest in North Korean affairs. What is your opinion about that? Okay. Um, this, I'm sorry, this was a question to Eric. To Lonnie, Lonnie Edge, I, I wanted to ask. So that's oh, topic. Okay. interesting, all of well, us. Let, let's go first with Lonnie, and then after that, we'll have uh, Virginia. Yeah. Okay, so um, I actually, that, that actually kind of dovetails. I skipped over some of my comments because of the five minute limit. And I would say that in South Korea right now, um, especially probably from the Im Young Bak presidency on, that South Koreans are less and less interested in North Korea. And I would say one of the hurdles to uh, President Moon's policy towards North Korea is that young, North, young South Koreans don't care. They're not interested in North Korea. They want President Moon to provide them with jobs and deal with youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, reunification is just a headache that they'll have to pay for, their children will have to pay for, and their grandchildren's grandchildren will have to pay for, kind of the way Germany just recently finally finished paying for its reunification. So um, one of the things that occurred to me in terms of this uh, conflict withering is that nowadays South Koreans, I think, feel more or less safe that North Korea isn't going to come across the 38th parallel and invade because mm -hmm. they have the U.S. ROK alliance, they have the U.S. nuclear umbrella, and there's enough deterrence to prevent North Korea from attacking. So they're more concerned in their, about their day-to-day -day life. So perhaps conflict withering could also just be North Korea is no longer as great or pressing a concern, especially to the Korean, South Korean populace, as it once was. So um, it's... it's, it's a, a rapidly deteriorating priority um, for the South Korean people. And eventually that should uh, be also demonstrated by governments perhaps spending less of their policy initiatives on uh, North Korea related uh, policy. So um, mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was going to ask if perhaps just relative weakness of North Korea vis-a-vis -vis South Korea um, could also be a form of wither. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, great. That uh, connects very well to Virginie. So it's it's your turn now, please. Yes, and then I have. Ed. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I just wanted to to go back to 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 one point that Marco had made in his comments about you know essentially what could constitute uh, a sudden change in the DPRK that could lead to something else that could lead to a, a, a major change. And uh, when I was considering that question, I was thinking, well, you know, if, to some extent, we we've had it, perhaps, um, you know, in 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 with the death of of, of Kim Jong Il. I mean, that was, uh, you know, the kind of change, you know, you know, we, even before we were thinking, well, you know, maybe 
there's no way the, go the, the government is going to, there's no way they're going to make it if, you know, the, 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 the leader uh, 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 passes away. Uh, and they're not ready yet for this transition. That transition hadn't been, you know, taking, a, you know, be, been organized as, 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 as thoroughly as the, the, the and, and in terms of length of time, as the transition from, from Kim Il-sung to, to Kim Jong-il had, had been. So in a way, at this point, you know, the, that has already happened, and we have seen um, uh, Kim Jong Un rise. You know, as a, as a, as as a, uh, uh, afterward, and there are quite a lot of um, often, you know, rumors about his health and whether he's he's still alive, if he's in coma, if his sister is taking over, and all of that. And and it seems that uh, that has, uh, to some extent, no type of event would not be a cataclysm cataclysmic event uh, to to change things. Um, so so to my mind, there's 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 very little uh, that could uh, that could create um, um, a, a sudden change. I think the, uh, the 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 one you know odd event would be um, uh, an attack uh, from from outside. You know uh, you know. For example, the United States, while well, you know, deciding to, uh, for one reason or another, to, um, to 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 launch something. But I think under under Donald Trump, this is very unlikely, since there is a very you know a very clear uh, message to 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 really not not spend anything on 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 the foreign. So I just you know those are the kind of things that I think think about at night, essentially, <laughs> you know, amongst other things is you know about this this notion of of change and and how it's it's quite unlikely. I, I see it as being a very 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 slow 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 process. Uh, and the comment that Loni was just making about how people are are, are not really that interested, how this generation is not that interested. But I remember the first time I, I went I went to, to South Korea, you know, in ninety seven, very different times. Um and there was no interest then either. I was so surprised at so the, the lack of interest that uh people my age seem to have in issues that were right out there when their door essentially. So I think it's quite it's quite interesting that things don't change. Uh, in that way. That, that's it for the moment. <laughs> Good. Wonderful. Um, if I may say something about this last point from a German perspective or somebody <laughs> with a German experience, there was no interest at all in, in Germany uh, for the German unification, not only amongst the youngsters, but most, uh, almost all of the, of the Germans back then. But that's, of course, another story. And I, I get your point. Um, Ed, please, it's your turn. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, really building, hopefully building anyway, on this discussion. And uh, it was something, something that Lonnie said, but it, fe it feeds very much into the, the wider discussion that we're having here about, uh, as you just said, that the South Koreans are, are not interested because they feel safe. They, they have no great fear that North Korea is about to, to cross the 38th. Um, but that all of that rests on the premise of the US ROK alliance, which of course has been strong and solid uh, throughout time. We are in this very weird period of time in which Donald Trump is president, which still feels like an episode of The Simpsons to me, but is actually our reality. Now, it may well be over in a couple of months' time, or, uh, I mean, who knows, he may get a second term. But what he has done, whatever your views may be, what he has done across the world, not just not just in East Asia, but but I think particularly in East Asia, is he has undermined the solidity of faith in those alliances, with whether it's with South Korea or whether it's with Japan, uh, but also if you think about the confidence in NATO here in Europe. This has been undermined by Donald Trump. Now, this doesn't just get washed away if Biden is elected in November, because what we have seen as a world is that the United States is not fixed anymore. That just if Trump goes, just because he's gone, it doesn't mean that another Trump-like figure could come back. The not quite half, but almost half of the US electorate that elected Donald Trump are still there. They could elect somebody else like that again in the future. And so that kind of view on foreign policy and alliances could well come back. Now, that's a calculation that uh, people, uh, policymakers in those alliances need to take into account when they're thinking about uh, the future. And that surely must apply to South Korea. I guess 
Some of this is a bit speculative. Well, it's very speculative because we're talking about a, a, a longer effect of something that hasn't even finished yet, which is the Trump presidency. But I do wonder if this safety and security about uh, North Korea never being able to invade, if that has been potentially fatally undermined by the Trump presidency. I wonder if that's... It, this isn't a question for anybody specifically, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, I, I just wonder what the longer-term effects will be. OK, thanks. Who, who wants to to react to, to this? I mean, we, yes, please, to, to this question, right? Yeah, me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, talk more to Eric. I, uh, yes, I also uh, presume, I also guess that you uh, thought that uh, uh, this concept of nuclear state identity uh, might be changed based on the uh, change of the uh, threats. Uh, that is the concept of the construction uh, theory. Yeah, but uh, this uh, concept of nuclear state identity could uh, give some misunderstanding to the uh, other side, uh, for example, the, yeah, the, in, into the world. Some of the conservative uh, peoples uh, understand it, that uh, North Korea uh, didn't have any uh, intention to uh, dismantle or uh, denuclearize the, uh, their uh, uh, facilities. At this cons in this uh, 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 point of view that I'd like to uh, uh, mention that uh, uh, this uh, uh, failure of the dis uh, negotiations during the past 30 years could uh, also affect to uh, strengthen the, this uh, nuclear state identity in North Korea. So, uh, so how do you think uh, this this uh, nuclear state can be uh, affected by the uh, others' change. I mean, the, if the, if the, how, then how can we find some solution to break this uh, deadlock, deadlock between the, uh, North Korea and the uh, United States in, to make us sit on the table, uh, negotiation table? Or if it does not... Uh, it could not be possible to sit in the table uh, together, two sides, then what would be happened uh, during this uh, uh, competition between the China and the United States? Well, okay. uh, please. Well, I would say uh, to, your, to your question, this is, is not so much focused now on, on my approach or, or uh, identity as a, as a central concept in explaining why North Korea does what it does or how it behaves or why it behaves how it behaves, uh, but more so than what, what you just mentioned, uh, of course, is a reflection of uh, the extreme challenges we are facing if we're even going to talk about uh, the issues which are at hand here, denuclearization, uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula. These are such huge political projects which require political will from all sides uh, involved into this. Uh, and we saw during, as you mentioned, during the, the, the couple, last couple of decades, uh, how extremely difficult uh, it was to actually put something on the table for all uh, for all involved parties to sign. So that, of course, speaks to the lack of trust uh, between the involved uh, actors, which has been certainly one of the uh, main obstacles in, in, putting, in, in, in pushing this process uh, forward. Uh, also, it goes to show that we cannot single out one of those uh, aspects. We cannot talk about uh, denuclearization of, of North Korea without uh, mentioning or uh, discussing about uh, security on, in, in broader uh, Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia. We cannot uh, basically think about or talk about denuclearization without talking about a peace regime or an altered uh, security architecture in, in Northeast Asia. Uh, so, so I get that this challenge is extremely difficult, that, that uh, this is an extremely difficult uh, challenge. and. You asked about the role of, of Europe before. Uh, 
you know that I'm very skeptical about Europe playing any role in this particular uh, process here. But if it can do something, uh, I think, uh, and, and I agree with what Virginia told before, that we have to be very careful when we talk about the European role, uh, if we talk about the EU as an institutional actor, or if we talk about the role of certain member states. And I agree that certain member states can play a role here, even in, in building trust. Uh, and we saw this during the last two years, uh, vividly done by Sweden, for example. There is a reason why both working level uh, discussions between the US and North Korea has been held uh, in, in Stockholm, uh, in, in Sweden. So uh, this is something Europe can offer to provide a space, a discrete space for discussion to bring the involved parties together, uh, but not so much to sit, of course, on, on the same table, but more act as a, a third party facilitator. Thanks. Virginia? Yeah, just a quick comment to, to go back to what Ed was talking about and, and, and Eric as well for, for, for on that question. You know, there's this, this, this disease of an organization gap uh, in, in Northeast Asia that has been put forward by, by Calder, you know, saying that there's a lack of, you know, those processes and all of that. And actually, when we have a look at the, this Korean situation, we do have, uh, we've had a lot of processes and we have a lot of bilateral, you know, engagement and also s s some other types of engagement, as Eric was mentioning. The thing is that if you are going to come to the table, coming to the table is no longer the problem. It used to be actually the main thing. How do we get North Korea to the negotiation table? And there were all kinds of carrots, you know, involved, you know, behind this uh, to make them accept, you know, sitting at this table. It's no longer, you know, now that we've had the, the summits that Donald Trump has offered, the, the, those, the, those summits, coming to the negotiation table is no longer a problem. Actually, why you're coming is the problem because you can all sit around the table and actually have really nothing to, that you want to talk about and nothing that you want to compromise on. And I think that is the, the real problem is that we are, it seems to me we are back at a, the place where the interests really do not overlap. We do not have this, this zone of possible agreement. You know, we are still at the basic conundrum of the United States talking about the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea talking about the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but North Korea talking about the entire peninsula and the United States talking about North Korea only. That is, you know, still the, the issue that, that hasn't changed. And this is also why the, the, the last summit collapsed. Uh, and unless this 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 core uh, issue is is resolved by you know we've we've had a conversation about this you know a little while ago, uh, uh, earlier earlier in this panel, then to me, I don't, I don't see why we would be coming to the table, you know. Okay, wonderful. We have four minutes left. <clears throat> Are there any last questions or comments? I uh, hear from the organizer that there are no questions from um, the audience, which we hope is there, the other. Um, so that if there are no more questions here among ourselves, I would like to wrap up this um, very dynamic, very interesting, insightful panel and, and thank all of the participants, the presenters and uh, the discussants um, for their very interesting contributions. I really enjoyed uh, chairing this uh, panel on dynamic international relations on the Korean Peninsula from Europe. And um, of course, uh, Lonnie is in, in Korea, but uh, other uh, <laughs> than him and the, the, the audience in the back, there was a discussion about um, people from, from Europe uh, stationed, uh, based in Europe. And um, at this point, I'd like to add um, and to ask Virginie and add and in particular, uh, Sarah, these three, please don't leave us. Don't do that. Stay <laughs> with so, um, if there were really anything we could do, believe me, we would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe the next panel should be on, uh, no. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your contributions. This was really enjoyable and I hope to see you around soon in person, please, in person. <laughs> thank you and bye-bye.